Hi, Lord uh, David Elton, Your Excellencies, <laughs> Professor Arnold de Mayer, distinguished guests, colleagues, uh, students, friends, associates. My only duty here is to say thank you so much for taking time off to come and you are in for a treat. And the treat begins with the welcome address by the President of Singapore Management University, Professor Arno Di Mayer. Good afternoon or good evening here in our uh, Moktariadi Auditorium for this uh, first um, week and we, uh, or annual week and we, distinguished lecture on educational leadership. It, I'm uh, very pleased to be here tonight and to welcome all of you, in particular Lord Alton uh, and uh, my colleagues and uh, students uh, to this uh, uh, leadership, educational leadership lecture. Uh, I'm very happy about that uh, for three reasons. That is, first of all, as an educator, I feel always uh, interested or I'm always interested in hearing what others have to say and how others think about education. Uh, but in particular, I'm happy to hear that uh, from somebody who has been a teacher or an educator for a very long time and has thought a lot about that whole education process. Um, I'm also happy that we have this uh, lecture here, uh, this first annual lecture uh, on education leadership and that we have been able to uh, organized with the generous support of the Training Vision Institute. Um, this was set up as an annual lecture uh, under the auspices of the Week and Read Center here at SMU, and we are delighted this, that this annual lecture will run for five years, starting today with Lord Alton's inaugural lecture. Um, as time moves on, uh, so does thinking about education and related aspects. Uh, education is changing. Uh, I actually have decided for myself that I will try to avoid the word teaching uh, and that, we, that I move much more to the words learning uh, because the teaching is not important. The teaching is only a tool uh, to actually stimulate that learning process and the way we teach or the way what the role of educators is is actually changing very rapidly. Probably for the first time in more than 150 years that we suddenly see this sort of change in our business of education uh, changing at, uh, at almost light speed. Um, indeed, we also see here in Singapore that we see a shift from a career-driven basis for education. Uh, we like to look, think about what is the role of education and the core position of education in society. Um, it is therefore quite natural that we start thinking about what's the role of leadership, sorry, education in citizenships, in citizenship. What kind of citizens are we graduating from our schools? What kind of citizens are we graduating from polytechnics, colleges and universities? And what kinds of leadership does new thinking in education require or even demand? And those are some of the challenges that we actually will address in the lectures this year and probably also in the coming years. Now, as president of SMU, I'd like to add two or three personal notes, that is, when we talk about citizen, citizenship and education for citizenship, I think we had last week an absolute perfect example of how important it is to teach about citizenship in education. I think all of us have learned tremendously from all the uh, broadcasts that we saw about Mr. Lee Kuan Yew and how he shaped and built uh, this country. And understanding that probably makes it much easier to operate in this society. Therefore, education for the citizenship, as I said, was tremendously well illustrated last week uh, through all the activities and all the, the ceremonies and all the, 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 the respect that we showed for Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, all the gratitude that we had for what he done. Secondly, as um, uh, president of SMU, I'm actually quite proud that we already go a little bit in the direction of educating people for uh, citizenship. Uh, we may not call it that way, but we have several aspects um, that, uh, that, um, uh, that, that go in that same direction. And uh, as many of you know, uh, SMU made it compulsory for graduating at SMU that you do community service. 
uh, and in that community service or through that community service a minimum of 80 hours but in practice a lot more because the average is about 150 hours per student um, through that minimum of 80 hours and that average of 150 hours of community service we actually hope that our students will understand their role in society we actually couple that at something that we called life lessons which is next to our normal academic program and in which students in the first years or in the first time the first period at university will first discover themselves then will discover what their role is in teams and groups at SMU and then finally uh, will discover what their role as a change agent and a leader in society is all about so these life lessons are a very important part of our curriculum uh, and are a little way uh, or a little uh, and they, they show that we go a little way in the direction of uh, education for leadership the third point why as president I'm happy here is that I know that in the announcements it was also indicated that elements of diversity play an important role uh, in educating for uh, citizenship uh, I'm a strong believer in the value of diversity I'm a strong believer that we have to make sure that this university is accessible pe for people with uh, differences. People call that often disabilities or um, differences in racial or ethnic background, gender issues. Uh, I want to ensure, and uh, through the activities of our diversity and inclusion unit, we want to make sure that people with differences feel very comfortable on this campus and can explore the best of themselves can groom can, can grow them uh, as, as well as possible that this is a university that allows you if you're capable to be admitted that allows you to develop yourself to your utmost so for these reasons I'm very happy to be here tonight I'm looking forward uh, to learn from you Lord Alton and uh, I thank you for the effort you made to come here and share with us uh, your ideas I guess I leave it now to Kirpal to make the final introductions. Thank you. Right. Thank you so much, uh, <laughs> President. Um, for the past many years, we have been very fortunate at the Wikimedia Center in having a very viable and sustaining partnership with Training Vision Institute. And I thought it might be appropriate at this point to ask uh, Mr. David Quay, who is the CEO of Training Vision Institute, to come up and present a check uh, to our president. Thank you so much. I believe uh, all of you would have a copy of this. In the center, there is a write up on uh, Lord Elton and also a reference to where you can Google him. In fact, you don't even need the uh, synopsis and the introduction to Lord Elton here because we just type into the internet, uh, Lord David Elton, a lot of things come up. But what I have been very impressed with, just uh, having met Lord Elton for the first time yesterday and having had quite a bit of interaction for much of today, is what is not here, and that is that he's an impassioned traveler, one who actually has taken in uh, a lot as he has traveled around the world from the East to Africa and several other nations. It's also not just the traveling in terms of just being touristy, but traveling in terms of seeing what really is happening at the human level and how societies, communities, especially minor communities or minority communities um, are being treated, are treating themselves, and the way they are also treating other people. So he is absolutely um, qualified, in fact, more than qualified. And this is why we thought that to inaugurate this very important series of lectures on educational leadership, it would be a great honor to have Lord David Elton internationally respected as an educator, as a politician, and much, much more. But we're all here to hear him, so I shall cut my introduction short and invite Lord David Elton to address us now. David Elton. Mr. President, Professor Singh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, thank you very much indeed for the invitation to be with you this evening. Those words we have heard now in the introductions, words like citizenship and 
leadership, diversity, the position of minorities, all of those are questions that I'll explore in my remarks this evening. And what better place in which to do it than in Singapore Management University, given everything that the President has said to you already about the commitments that you already have as an institution to the promotion of citizenship? And what more appropriate time as well to hold this lecture, which is dedicated, of course, to the memory of Wee Kim Wee, uh, who held that education was central to the cultivation of citizenship. But at this time, when you are commemorating in Singapore the extraordinary achievements of both Singapore and its founding father, Lee Kuan Yew. So it's a, an extraordinary moment. We didn't know when the lecture was scheduled that such momentous events would occur as those which have occurred over these last seven days in Singapore. But I feel particularly honored uh, to be with you at this time and to be able to share something from my own life which has partly been involved in education. I qualified as a young teacher and spent seven years teaching. But during my last year as a student, and I'd say this to some of you who are students today, you're never too young to begin. Age is not the issue here. When I was a student, I got involved in local politics in my city in Liverpool. And I'm not sure that my uh, vice chancellor at the time would have been very enthusiastic about it, but I was elected to the local council while I was in my last year as a student. It wasn't the question of my academic studies or local involvement, it was a question of doing both. And subsequently, I was elected at the end of the March, month of March in 1979, as the youngest member of the House of Commons and spent 18 years there. But I've also held a chair in citizenship at my university in Liverpool, a university of 26,000 students, and a university where we have the Roscoe Foundation for Citizenship, named for the wonderful abolitionist William Roscoe, the founding father of Liverpool culture, and who campaigned against the slave trade in a city of, whose name was synonymous with that evil trade. He stood against the tide because he'd been formed in values that mattered. And he didn't do one thing or the other. He was a bibliophile. He was an environmentalist. He was an educator of women at a time when no one educated women. He was someone who poured himself out for what I'll describe in the lecture as the common good. So that's enough about the setting, as it were. When Dr. Singh asked me to take as my subject education for citizenship, he asked me if I would uh, do so in the context of a world being convulsed by violence and conflict and being disfigured by intolerance. Uh, and such a contrast to one of Singapore's central achievements, but we see that civic disaggregation is something that is taking place in so many places. It was Henry David Forrow who once asked, how can you expect the birds to sing when the groves are cut down? And I think at the heart of what I want to say this evening is that by educating for citizenship, we're planting new trees from which the birds will once again sing. All societies and all situations need constant renewal and constant regeneration. Now, it's true in the United Kingdom, certainly, and I think it's true in other jurisdictions. There's been a run of confidence in many of our institutions. Banks have seen their reputations tarnished by deliberate mis-selling, and we saw much of that during the financial crisis. The media has been disfigured and dishonored by things like phone hacking. Parliament has been disfigured by falsified expense claims. And many aspects of social and economic life are in turmoil. Trust, therefore, in so many institutions has been badly damaged and in need of renewal. But if you cut down all the trees, educational institutions, parliament, the banks, all of the institutions I've been describing, if you just cut down the trees, there will be nowhere left for the birds to sing. So we have to be more creative than that. Singapore is renowned for its meritocracy, but meritocracies must always especially guard against leaders becoming a detached elite. The fundamental principle of democratic leadership is to serve, to serve those whom you've been entrusted to lead. Educating for citizenship must inspire a new generation imbued with the concept of servant leadership, capable of renewing institutions and the vibrancy of society. And that is something that has to happen in every generation. 
Dr. Singh reminded me of the time when we routinely taught every child something that we used to call in England civics, when we saw education as being about a preparation for life, not just for work. Well, it was a British member of Parliament, Sir William Curtis, who at the end of the 18th century used the phrase, the three R's, meaning reading, writing, and arithmetic, to emphasize the basic skills which every individual needs to be employable or to access higher levels of education. But that idea has even earlier origins. In the fifth century, St. Augustine, in his Confessions, noted that, and I quote, for those first lessons, reading, writing, and arithmetic, I fought as a greater burden and penalty as any Greek. Uh, interestingly, Winston Churchill famously admitted that having to learn Latin had been a burden for him, saying that he saw little purpose in learning how to address a table in six different ways. <laughs> Education uh, can indeed become a burden or a penalty if it degenerates into an obsession with memorizing vocabulary or merely understanding quadratic equations. Now, Charles Dickens captured the futility of that kind of education in his classic novel, Hard Times. His fictional teacher, Thomas Gradgrind, never sees education as being about values or about the deepening of a man's mind, but tells us, now what I want is facts. Teach these boys and girls nothing but facts. Facts alone are wanted in life. Plant nothing else and root out everything else. You can only form the minds of reasoning animals upon facts. Nothing else will ever be of any service to them. But, friends, is a world of the three R's and an education based merely on the regurgitation of facts, a world of numbers and memorized rote learning, enough? In Dickens's fictionalized account, Gradgrind creates a world devoid of humanity, of compassion, gentle intellectual inquiry. And he fails both as a teacher and as a father, seeing his own son become a thief. Now contrast Gradgrind's view of education with that of the first words of the Confucian classic, The Great Learning, where it said, the way of great learning consists in manifesting one's bright virtue, one's bright virtue. It consists in the loving of the people. It consists in stopping imperfect goodness. Or contrast Gradgrind's education with John Henry Newman's description of what a university should be. It is, he said, a seat of wisdom, a light of the world, a minister of the faith, an alma mater of the rising generation. It is this and a great deal more. Newman listed the intellectual virtues as good sense, sobriety of thought, reasonableness, candor, self-command, and steadfastness of view. Now, these days in the knowledge economy, as we put it, where there's less time for learning for its own sake, we must be careful not to replace Gradgrind's narrow vision with our own equally narrow one, and one which doesn't fulfill the criteria of either Confucius or Newman. Once the mind has been formed and the intellect has been connected with the foundational principles, a modern civic education must surely have something to say about how we interact our, with our fellow citizens and how we interact with the world in which we live. So instead of merely educating for facts, we must therefore educate for virtue, educate for citizenship. Now what do I mean by this? An education for citizenship, in my view, would enable young people in particular to reach beyond academic attainment alone, to think, inquire, debate, and understand how decisions will affect their lives and the future of their nation and the future of the world. If we educate young people for citizenship, we'll need to lay before them potential ethical dilemmas, moral conundrums, technological and scientific challenges, the rapidly changing pace of living, world crises ranging from hunger to the use of violence and terror to global warming to the exploitation of finite resources. A civic education must, above all, underline the moral significance of self-knowledge, enabling us to see ourselves as agents in the way we live and in the way that we affect others. We need citizens who embrace the idea of ethical responsibility for their individual and their collective actions. 
This kind of education will be the antidote to intolerance and barbarism, the antidote to ignorance. It was C.S. Lewis who warned against educators who, as he put it, make men without chests, who cease to be educators and become what he called conditioners. He said that the task of modern education is not to cut down jungles, but to irrigate deserts. The right defense, he said, against false sentiments is to inculcate just sentiments. By starving the sensibility of our pupils, we only make them easier prey to the propagandist when he comes. And in a characteristically blunt turn of phrase, uh, Lewis, who of course taught both at the University of Oxford and the University of Cambridge, uh, Mr. President, you'll be glad to know, given your Cambridge antecedents, he said that our hollowed out education system can treat children like geldings. He said we bid them be fruitful only to neuter them. But it needn't be like this. Matthew Arnold, poet, educationalist, and son of the famous Victorian headmaster Thomas Arnold, passionately believed that education should ensure that students have access to the best which has been said and fought, and never simply be focused on the mercantile needs of an industrial state. The aim and office of instruction is to enable a man to know himself and the world. To, to know himself, a man must know the capabilities and performances of the human spirit, which is the value of the humanities, but it's also a vital and formative knowledge to know the world, the laws which govern nature, and man as a part of nature. So, self-knowledge and knowledge of your place in society. And in contemporary terms, this surely requires a compact between educationalists, commerce, and the state to produce graduates who connect with the wider needs of society. This is especially true now that there is mass participation in university education. By creating education for citizenship, we'll also provide better graduates for business and employers and form agents for change. Now contrast the following two worldviews with what I, I've just said to you. It was Nelson Mandela having been incarcerated for 27 years, who correctly observed that education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world. But elsewhere in Africa, in Nigeria, where elections have been taking place over these last two days, Boko Haram, which means eradicate Western education, also understands the power of education, which is why they abduct young girls to deny them an education and, in cold blood, murder sleeping students in their dormitories. No one understands better the power of education and the first of those two world views than the youngest Nobel laureate, Pakistan's Malala Yousafzai, whom the Taliban tried to murder after Malala spoke up for the right of girls to receive an education. As Malala says, one child, one teacher, one book, one pen can change the world. How right is the old Chinese proverb which states that if you want to plant for one season, you should plant a seed. If you want to plant for 10 years, you should plant a tree. But if you want to plant for life, you should give a young man or woman an education. I passionately believe that. And believe that a rounded education will go beyond the mantra of reading, writing, and arithmetic, the formulaic facts of Thomas Gradgrind.